Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Jennifer, and we are at the um, next installment of Anne of Green Gables, and we will get started. We left off in the middle of a chapter, so we will start. Did anybody ever see such a temper? exclaimed the horrified Mrs. Rachel. And go to your room and stay there until I come up said Marilla, recovering her powers of speech with difficulty. Anne, bursting into tears, rushed to the hall. Door slammed it until the tins on the porch wall outside rattled in sympathy and fled through the hall and up the stairs like a whirlwind. A subdued slam above told that the door of the east gable had been shut with equal vehemence. Well, I don't envy you your job bringing that up, Marilla, said Mrs. Rachel with unspeakable solemnity. Marilla opened her lips to say she knew not what apology or deprecation. What she did say was a surprise to herself and then ever afterwards. You shouldn't have twitted about her looks, Rachel. Marilla Cuthbert, you don't mean to say that you are, an up, you are upholding her in such a terrible, terrible display of temper as we've just seen? demanded Mrs. Marilla, uh, Mrs. Rachel indignantly. No, said Marilla slowly. I'm not trying to excuse her. She's been very naughty, and I'll have to give her a talking to about it. But we must make allowances for her. You've never been taught what is right, and you, or she's never been taught what is right, and you were too hard on her, Rachel. Marilla could not help tacking on that last sentence, although she was again surprised at herself for doing it. Mrs. Rachel got up with an air of offended dignity. Well, I see that I'll have to be very careful what I say after this. Marilla, such, such the fine feelings of orphans brought from goodness knows where have to be considered before anything else. Oh no, I'm not vexed. Don't worry yourself. I'm too sorry for you to leave any room for anger in my mind. You'll have your own troubles with that child, but if you'll take my advice, which I suppose you won't do, although I've brought up ten children and buried two, you'll do that talking to you mentioned with a fair size birch switch. I should think that would be the most effective language for what kind of a child. Her temper, temper matches her hair, I guess. Well, good evening, Marilla. I hope you'll come down to see me as often as you, usual, but you can't expect me to visit here again in a hurry. If I'm liable to be flunked, flown at and insulted in such a fashion it's something new in my experience whereat mrs rachel swept out and away if a fat woman who always waddled could be said to sweep, sweep away and marilla with a very solemn face betook herself to the east gable on the way upstairs she pondered uneasily as to what she ought to do she felt no little dismay over the scene that had just been enacted how unfortunate that Anne should have displayed such temper before Mrs. Rachel Lynde, of all the people. Then Marilla suddenly became aware of an uncomfortable and rebuking consciousness that she felt more, humili felt more humiliation over this than sorrow over the discovery of such a serious defect in Anne's disposition. And how was she to punish her? The amicable suggestion of the birch switch to the efficiency of which all of Mrs. Rachel's own children could have borne smarting testimony did not appeal to Marilla. She did not believe she could whip a child. No, some other method of punishment that must be found to bring Anne a proper re realization of the enormity of her offense. Marilla found Anne face down on her bed, crying bitterly, quite obvious of muddy boots on a cl clean counterpane. Anne, she said not ungently, no answer. Anne, with great severity, get off that bed this minute and listen to what I have to say to you. Anne squirmed off the bed and sat rigid rigidly on a chair beside her, her face swollen and tear stained and her eyes fixed stubbornly on the floor. This is a way for you to behave, Anne. Aren't you ashamed of, aren't you ashamed of yourself? She hadn't any right to call me ugly and redheaded, retorted Anne, evasive and defiant. You hadn't any right to fly such a fury and talk the way you did to her, Anne. I was ashamed of you, thoroughly ashamed of you. I wanted you to behave nicely to Mrs. Lynde, and instead of that, you have disgraced me. I'm sure I don't know why you should you lose your temper like that just because Mrs. Lynde said you were red-haired, red -haired, 
and homely. You say it yourself often enough. Oh, but there's such a difference between saying a thing yourself and hearing other people say it, wailed Anne. You may know a thing is so, but you can't help hoping other people don't think it is. I suppose you think I have an awful temper, but I couldn't help it. When she said those things, something just rose right up in me and choked me. I had to fly out to her. Well, you made a fine exposition expo, expo, yeah, of yourself, I must say. Mrs. Lynde will have a nice story to tell about you everywhere, and she'll tell it too. It was a dreadful thing for you to lose your temper like that, Anne. Just imagine how you would feel if somebody told you your face, told you to your face that you were skinny and ugly, pleaded Anne tearfully. An old remembrance suddenly rose up before Marilla. She had been a very small child when she had heard one aunt say to her, of her to another. What a pity she's such a dark, homely little thing. Marilla was every day of fifty before the sting had gone out of that memory. I don't think, don't say that I think Mrs. Lynde was exactly right in saying what she did to you, Anne, she admitted in a softer tone. Rachel was too outspoken, but that is no excuse for such behavior on your part. She was a stranger and an elderly person and my visitor. All three very good reasons why you should have been respectful to her. You were rude and saucy and Marilla had a saving inspiration of punishment. You must go to her and tell her you are very sorry for your bad temper and ask her to forgive you. I can never do that, said Anne determinedly and darkly. You can punish me in any way you'd like, Marilla. You can shut me up in a dark, damp dungeon inhabited by snakes and toads and feed me only bread and water. I shall not complain, but I cannot ask Mrs. Lynde to forgive me. We're not in the habit of shutting people up in a dark, damp dungeon dungeons, said Marilla dryly, especially as they rather scarce and avonly. But apologize to Mrs. Lynde, you must, and you shall, and you'll stay here in your room until you can tell me you're willing to do it. I shall have to stay here forever then, said Anne mournfully, because I can't tell Mrs. Lynde I'm sorry I said those things to her. How can I? I am not sorry. I'm sorry I vexed you, but I'm glad I told her just what I did. It was a great satisfaction. I can't say I'm sorry when I'm not, can I? I can't even imagine I'm sorry. Perhaps your imagination will be in better working order by the morning, said Marilla, rising to depart. You have the night to think over your conduct in and come to a better frame of mind. You said you would try to be a very good girl if we kept you at Green Gables, but I must say it hasn't seemed very much like it this evening. Leaving this Parthian shaft to rankle in Anne's bed story bosom, Marilla descended to the kitchen, grievously troubled in mind and vexed in soul. She was as angry with herself as with Anne, because whenever she recalled Mrs. Rachel's dumbfounded countenance, her lips twitched with amusement, and she felt a most re reprehensible desire to laugh. Chapter 10 Anne's Apology Marilla said nothing to Matthew about the affair that evening, but when Anne proved still refractory the next morning on explanation had to be made, an explanation had to be made to her count for her absence from the breakfast table. Marilla told Matthew the whole story, taking pains to impress him with due sense of enormity of Anne's good behavior. It's a good thing Rachel Lynde got a calling down. She's a meddlesome old gossip, said Matthew's consolatory re rejoinder. Matthew Cuthbert, I'm astonished at you. You know that Anne's behavior was dreadful, and yet you take her part? I suppose you'll be saying next thing that she oughtn't to be punished at all. Well, no, 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 not exactly, said Matthew uneasily. I reckon she ought to be punished a little. But don't be too hard on her, Marilla. Recollect she hasn't ever had anyone to teach her right. You're, you're going to give her something to eat, aren't you? When did you ever hear of me starving people into good behavior? demanded Marilla indignantly. She'll have her meals regular. I'll carry them up to her myself. She'll stay up there until she's willing to apologize to Mrs. Lynde, and that's final, Matthew. Breakfast and dinner and supper were very silent meals, for Anne still remained obdurate. After each meal, Marilla carried a well-filled tray to the east gable and brought it down later on, not noticeably depleted. 
Matthew eyed its last descent with a troubled eye. Had Anne eaten anything at all? When Marilla went out that evening to bring the cows from the pasture, Matthew, who had been hanging about the barns and watching, slipped into the house with an air of a burglar and crept upstairs. As a general thing, Matthew gravitated between the kitchen and the little bedroom off the hall where he slept. Once in a while, he ventured uncomfortably into the parlor or sitting room where the minister came to tea. But he'd never been upstairs in his own house since the spring. He helped Marilla paper the spare bedroom, and that was four years ago. He tiptoed along the hall and stood for several minutes outside the door of the east gable before he summoned the courage to tap on it with his fingers and then opened a door to peep in. Anne was sitting on the yellow chair by the window, gazing mournfully out into the garden. Very small and unhappy she looked, and Matthew's heart smote him. He softly closed the door and tiptoed over to her. Anne, he whispered, as if afraid of being overheard. How are you making it, Anne? Anne smiled wanly. Pretty well. I imagine a good deal, and that helps to pass the time. Of course, it's rather lonesome, but then I may as well get used to that. Anne smiled again, bravely facing the long years of solitary imprisonment before her. Matthew recollected, re recollected that he must say what he had come to say without loss of time, lest Marilla returned prematurely. Well, now, Anne, don't you think you'd better do it and have it over with, he whispered. It'll have to be done sooner or later, you know, for Marilla's a dreadful determined woman. Dreadful determined, Anne. Do it right off, I say, and have it over. Do you mean apologize to Mrs. Lynde? Yes, apologize. That's the very word, said Matthew eagerly. Just smooth it over, so to speak. That's what I was trying to get at. I suppose I could do it to oblige you, said Anne thoughtfully. It would be true enough to say I'm sorry because I am sorry now. I wasn't a bit sorry last night. I was mad clear through, and I stayed mad all night. I know I did because I woke up three times, and I was just furious every time. But this morning it was over. I wasn't in a temper anymore, and it felt and it left a dreadful sore sort of goneness too. I felt so ashamed of myself, but I just couldn't think of going and telling Mrs. Lynde so. It would be so hum humiliating. I made up my mind I'd shut up here forever rather than do that, but still, I'd do anything for you if you really want me to. Well now, of course I do. It's terrible lonesome downstairs without you. Go and smooth things over. That's a good girl. Very well, said Anne Wright resignedly. I'll tell Marilla as soon as she comes in. I've repented. That's right. That's right, Anne. But don't tell Marilla I said anything about it. She might think I was putting my oar in, and I promise not to do that. Wild horses don't drag the se won't drag the secret from me, Anne promised solemnly. How would wild horses drag a secret from a person anyhow? But Matthew was gone, scared at his own success. He fled hastily to the remotest corner of the horse pasture, lest Marilla should suspect that he had been what he had been up to. Marilla herself, upon her return to the house, was agreeably surprised to hear a plaintive voice calling. Marilla, over the banisters. Well, she said, going into the hall, I'm sorry I've lost my temper and said rude things, and I'm willing to go and tell Mrs. Lynde so. Very well, Marilla's cr Christmas, crispus, crispness, gave no sign of her relief. She had been wondering what under the canopy she should do if Anne did not give in. I'll take you down after milking. Accordingly, after milking, behold Marilla and Anne walking down the lane, the former erect and triumphant, the latter drooping and dejected. But halfway down, Anne's dejection, dejection vanished as if by enchantment. She lifted her head and stepped lightly along. Her eyes fixed on, fixed on the sunset sky and an air of a subdued exhilaration about her. Marilla beheld the change disapprovingly. This was no meek weak. Yeah. Sorry, guys. This was no meek penitent, such as it behooved her to take into the presence of the offhand offended Mrs. Lynde. What are you thinking of, Anne? She asked sharply. I'm imagining out what I must say to Mrs. Lynde, answered Anne dreamily. This was satisfactory or should have been so. But Marilla could not rid herself of the notion that something in her scheme of punishment was going askew. 
Anne had no business to look so rapt and radiant. Rapt and radiant Anne continued until they were in the very presence of Mrs. Lynde, who was sitting knitting by her kitchen window. Then the radiance vanished. Mournful penitence appeared on every feature. Before a word was spoken, Anne suddenly went down on her knees before the astounded Mrs. Rachel and held out her hands beseechingly. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, I am so extremely sorry, she said with a quiver in her voice. I could never express all my sorrow. No, not if I used up a whole dictionary. You just must just imagine it. I behaved terribly to you, and I have disgraced the dear friends, Matthew and Marilla, who have let me stay at Green Gables, although I'm not a boy. I'm a dreadfully wicked and ungrateful girl, and I deserve to be punished and cast out by respectful people respectable people forever. It was very wicked of me to fly into a temper because you told me the truth. It was the truth. Every word you said was true. My hair is red and I'm freckled and skinny and ugly. What I said to you was true too, but I shouldn't have said it. Oh, Mrs. Lynn, please, please forgive me. If you refuse it, I, it will be a lifelong sorrow on a poor little orphan girl. Would you even if you had a dreadful temper? Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't. Please say you forgive me, Mrs. Lynde. Anne clasped her hands together, bowed her head, and waited for the word of judgment. There was no mistaking her sincerity. It breathed in every tone of her voice. Both Marilla and Mrs. Lynde recognized the unmistakable ring. But the former understood in dismay that Anne was actually enjoying her valley of, humili of humiliation and was reveling in the thoroughness of, the, of her abasement. Where was the wholesome punishment upon which she, Marilla, had plumbed herself? Anne had turned it into a species of positive pleasure. Good Mrs. Lynde, not being overburdened with perception, did not see this. She only perceived that Anne had made a very thorough apology, and all resentment vanished from her kindly, if somewhat officious, heart. There, there, get up, child, she said heartily. Of course I forgive you. I guess I was a little too hard on you anyway. But I'm such an outspoken person. You just mustn't mind me. That's what. It, can be it can't be denied your hair is terrible red. But I knew a girl once, went to school with her, in fact, whose hair was every mite as red as yours when she was young. But when she grew up, it darkened to a real handsome auburn. I wouldn't be a mite surprised if yours did too. Not a mite. Oh, Mrs. Lynde, Anne drew a long breath as she rose to her feet. You have given me a hope. I shall always feel that you are a benefactor. Oh, and I would endure anything if only I thought my hair would be a handsome auburn when I grew up. It would be so much easier to be good if one's hair was a handsome auburn, don't you think? And now I may go out into your garden. May I go out into your garden and sit on the bench under the, under the apple trees while you and... Marilla are talking. There is so much more scope for imagination out there. Laws, yes. Run along, child, and you can pick a bouquet of them while white June lilies over there in the corner if you like. As the door closed behind Anne, Mrs. Lynde got briskly up to light a lamp. She's a real odd little thing. Take this chair, Marilla. It's easier than the one you've got. I just keep that for the hired boy to sit on. Yes, she certainly is an odd child but there is something kind of taking about her after all. I don't feel so surprised at you and Matthew keeping her as I did, nor so sorry for you either. She may turn out all right, of course. She has a queer way of expressing herself, a little too, well, too kind of forcible, you know? But she's likely to get over that now that she's come to live among civilized folks. And then, her temper's pretty quick, I guess, but there's one comfort. A child that has a quick temper, just blaze up and cool down, ain't never likely to be sly or deceitful. Preserve me from a sly child, that's what. On the whole, Marilla, I kind of like her. When Marilla went home, Anne came out of the fragrant twilight orchard with a sheaf of white narcissi in her hands. I apologized pretty well, didn't I? She said proudly as they went down the lane. I thought since I had to do it, I might as well do it as thoroughly. You did it thoroughly all right enough, was Marilla's comment. Marilla was dismayed at finding herself inclined to laugh over the recollection. 
She had an uneasy feeling that she ought to scold Anne for apologizing so loud. But then, that was ridiculous. She compromised with her conscience by saying severely, I hope you won't have occasion to make many more such apologies. I hope you'll try to control your temper now, Anne. That wouldn't be so hard if people wouldn't twit me about my looks, said Anne with a sigh. I don't get cross about my other th about other things, but I am so tired of being twitted about my hair, and it just makes me boil right over. Do you suppose my hair really will be a handsome auburn when I grow up? You shouldn't think of so much about your looks, Anne. I'm afraid you are a very vain little girl. How can I be vain when I know I'm homely, protested Anne. I love pretty things, and I hate to look in the glass and see something that isn't pretty. It makes me feel so sorrowful, just as I feel when I look at an ugly thing. I pity it because it isn't beautiful. Handsome is as handsome does, quoted Marilla. I've had that said to me before, but I have my doubts about it, remained skeptical Anne, sniffing at her narcissi. Oh, aren't, this flower, aren't these flowers sweet? It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give them to me. I have no hard feelings against Mrs. Lynde now. It gives you a lovely, comfortable feeling to apologize and be forgiven, doesn't it? Are the stars bright tonight? If you could live in a star, which one would you pick? I'd like that lovely, clear, big one away over there above that dark hill. And do hold your tongue, said Marilla, thoroughly worn out, trying to follow the gyrations of Anne's thoughts. Anne said no more until they turned into their lane. A little gypsy wind came down to meet them, laden with spicy perfume of young dew-wet dew ferns. Far up in the shadows, a cheerful light gleamed out through the, the trees from the kitchen at Green Gables. Anne suddenly came close to Marilla and slipped her hand into the older woman's hard palm. It's lovely to be going home and know it's home, she said. I love Green Gables already and I have never loved any place before. No place ever seemed like home. Oh, Marilla, I'm so happy. I could pray right now and not find it a bit hard. Something warm and pleasant welled up in Marilla's heart at, at touch of that thin little hand in her own. A throb of the maternal maternity she had missed, perhaps. It was very unaccustomedness and sweetness disturbed her. She hastened to restore her sensations to the dry calm by inc inculcating a moral. If you'll be a good girl, you'll always be happy, Anne, and you should never find it hard to say your prayers. Saying one's prayers isn't exactly the same thing as praying, said Anne meditatively, but I'm going to imagine that I'm the wind that's blowing up there in those treetops. When I get tired of the trees, I will imagine I'm gently waving down here in the ferns and then I'll fly over to Mrs. Lynde's garden and set the flowers dancing, and then I'll go with one great swoop over the clover field, and then I'll blow, it, blow, blow over the lake of shining waters and ripple it all up into sparkling waves. Oh, there's so much scope for the imagination in a wind. So I'll not talk any more just now, Marilla. Thank goodness for that, said Marilla, in devout relief. Chapter 11, Anne's Impressions of Sunday School. Well, how do you like them, said Marilla. Anne was standing in the green gable room, looking solemnly at the three new dresses spread out on the bed. One was of a snuffy colored gingham, which Marilla had been tempted to buy from a peddler the preceding summer because it looked so serviceable. One was a black and white checkered sateen, which she had picked up at a bargain counter in the winter and one was a stiff print of an ugly blue shade which she had purchased that week at Carmody's store. She made them up herself, and they were all made alike, plain skirts, pulled tightly to plain waist, with sleeves as plain as waist and skirt, and tight as sleeves could be. I'll imagine that I'll like them, said Anne soberly. I don't want you to imagine it, said Marilla, offended. Oh, I can see you don't like the dresses. What is the matter with them? Aren't they neat and clean and new? Yes. Then why don't you like them? They're, they're not pretty, said Anne reluctantly. Pretty? Marilla sniffed. I didn't trouble my head about getting pretty dresses for you. I don't believe in pampering vanity, Annie. Anne, and I will tell you that right off. 
Those dresses are good, sensible, serviceable dresses without any frills or f- furbelows about them. And they're all you'll get this summer. The brown gingham and the blueprint will do you for school when you begin to go. The sateen is for church and Sunday school. I'll expect you to keep them neat and clean and not to tear them. I should think you'd be grateful to get most anything after these skippy, wincy things you've been wearing. Oh, I am grateful, protested Anne. But I'd never be so much gratefuler if if you made just one of them with puff sleeves. Puff sleeves are so fashionable now. It would give me such a thrill, Marilla, just to wear a dress with puff sleeves. Well, you'll have to do without your thrill. I hadn't any material to waste on puff sleeves. I think they are ridiculous looking things anyhow. I prefer the plain, sensible ones. But I'd rather look ridiculous when everybody else does the plain and sensible all by myself, persisted Anne mournfully. Trust you for that. Well, hang these dresses carefully up in your closet and then sit down and learn the Sunday school lesson. I got a quarterly from Mr. Bell for you and you'll go to, down, you'll go to Sunday school tomorrow, said Marilla, disappearing downstairs in high dudgeon. Anne clasped her hands and looked at the dresses. I did hope there would be a white one with puff sleeves, she whispered disconsolately. I prayed for one, but I didn't expect, I didn't expect it on that account. I didn't suppose God would have time to bother about a little orphan girl's dress. I knew I'd just have to depend on Marilla for it. Well, fortunately, I can imagine that one of them is a snow white muslin with lacy, lovely lace frills and three puffed sleeves. The next morning, warnings of a sick headache prevented Marilla from going to Sunday school with Anne. You'll have to go down and call for Mrs. Lynn, Anne, she said. She'll see that you get into the right class. Now mind, you behave yourself properly. Stay to preaching afterwards and ask Mrs. Lynn to show you our pew. Here's a cent for the collection. Don't stare at people. Don't fidget. I shall expect you to tell me the text when you come home. Anne started off irreproachable, arrayed in stiff black and white sateen, which while decent as regards in length, and certainly not open to the charge of skimpiness, contrived to emphasize every corner and angle of her thin figure. Her hat was a little flat, glossy, new sailor, the extreme plainness of which had likewise much disappointed Anne, who permitted herself secret visions of ribbons and flowers. The latter, however, were supplied before Anne reached the main road, for being confronted halfway down the lane with a golden frenzy of wind-stirred buttercups and a glory of wild roses, Anne promptly and liberally garlanded her hat with a heavy wreath of them. Whatever other people might have thought of the result, it satisfied Anne, and she tripped gaily down the road, holding her ruddy head with, with its decoration of pink and yellow very proudly. When she had reached Mrs. Lynde's house, she found that the, the lady gone. Nothing daunted, Anne proceeded onward to the church alone. In the porch, she found a crowd of little girls, all more or less gaily attired in whites and blues and pinks, and all staring with curious eyes at the stranger in their midst with her extraordinary head adornment. Avalon little girls had already heard queer stories about Anne. Mrs. Lynde said she had an awful temper. Jerry Boat, the hired boy at Green Gable, said she talked all the time to herself or to the trees and flowers like a crazy girl. They looked at her and whispered to each other behind their quarterlies. Nobody made any friendly advances. Then, or later on, when opening exercises were over and Anne found herself in Miss Rogerson's class. Miss Rogerson was a middle-aged lady who had taught a Sunday school class for 20 years. Her method of teaching was to ask the printed questions from the quarterly and look sternly over its edge at the particular little girl she had thought ought to answer the question. She looked very often at Anne, and Anne, thanks to Marilla's drilling, answered promptly. But it may be questioned if she understood very much about either question or answer. She did not think she liked Mrs. Rogerson, and she felt very miserable. Every other little girl in the class had puffed sleeves. Anne felt that life was really not worth living without puff sleeves. Well, how did you like Sunday school, Marilla wanted to know when Anne came home. 
her wreath having faded, and discarded it in the lane. So Marilla was spared the knowledge of that for a time. I didn't like it a bit. It was horrid. Anne Shirley, said Marilla rebukingly. Anne sat down on the rocker with a long sigh, kissed one of the bonnie's leaves, and waved her hand to a blossoming fuchsia. They might have been lonesome while I was away, she explained. And now, about the Sunday school. I behaved well, just as you told me. Mrs. Lynde was gone, but I went right on myself. I went into the church with a lot of other little girls, and I sat in the corner of a pew by the window while the opening exercises went on. Mr. Bell made an awful long prayer. I would have been dreadfully tired before he got through if I hadn't been sitting by that window. But it looked right out on the lake of shining waters. So I just gazed at that and imagined all sorts of splendid things. You shouldn't have done anything of the sort. You should have listened to Mr. Bell. But he wasn't talking to me, protested Anne. He was talking to God, and he didn't seem to be very much interested in it either. I think he thought God was too far off, though. There was a long row of white birches hanging over the lake, and the sunshine fell down through them, way, way down, deep into the water. Oh, Marilla, it was like a beautiful dream. It gave me a thrill, and I just said, thank you, God, for it two or three times. Not out loud, I hope, said Marilla anxiously. Oh, no, just under my breath. Well, did Mr. Bell get through at last? Mr. Bell did get through at last, and they told me to go into the classroom with Mrs. Rogerson's class. There were nine other girls in it. They all had puff sleeves. I tried to imagine mine were puffed too, but I couldn't. Why couldn't I? It was as easy as could be to imagine they were puffed when I was alone in the East Gable, but it was awfully hard there among the others who had really, truly puffs. You shouldn't have been thinking about your sleeves in Sunday school. You should have been attending to the lesson. I hope you knew it. Oh, yes, and I answered a lot of questions. Mrs. Rogerson asked ever so many. I don't think it was fair for her to do all the asking. There were lots I wanted to ask her, but I didn't like to because I didn't think she was a kindred spirit. Then all the other girls recited a paraphrase. She asked me if I knew any. I told her I didn't, but I could recite the dog at his master's grave if she liked. That's in the third royal reader. It isn't really a true religious piece of poetry, but it's so sad and melancholy Collie, that it might as well be. She said it wouldn't do, and she told me to learn the 19th paraphrase for next Sunday. I read it over in church afterwards, and it's splendid. There are two lines in, the, in particular that just throw me. Quick as the slaughtered squadrons fell in Midian's evil day. I don't know what squadrons mean, nor Midian either, but it sounds so tragical. I can hardly wait until next Sunday to recite it. I'll practice it all week. After Sunday school, I asked Mrs. Rogerson because Mrs. Lind was too far away to show me your pew. I sat just as still as I could, and the text was Revelations, third chapter, second and third verses. It was a very long text. If I was a minister, I'd pick the short, snappy ones. The sermon was awfully long, too. I suppose the minister had to match it to the text. I didn't think he was a bit interesting. The trouble with him seems to be that he hasn't enough imagination. I didn't listen to him very much. I just let my thoughts run, and I thought of the most surprising things. Marilla felt, felt helpless, helplessly that all of this should be very stern reproved, but she was hampered by the undeniable fact that some of the things Anne had said, especially about the minister's sermons and Mr. Bell's prayers, were what she herself had really thought deep down in her heart for years, but had never given expression to it. It almost seemed to her that those secret, unuttered, critical thoughts had suddenly taken visible and accusing shape and form in the person of this outspoken morsel of neglected humanity. Chapter 12, A Solemn Vow and Promise. It was not until the Friday, next Friday that Marilla had heard the story of the flower wreath tat. She came she came home from Mrs. Lynde's and called Anne to account. Anne, Mrs. Rachel said you went to church last Sunday with your hat rigged out ridiculous with roses and buttercups. What on earth put you up to such a caper? A pretty looking object you must have been. Oh, 
I know pink and yellow aren't becoming to me, Aunt began Anne. Becoming? Fiddlesticks! It was putting flowers on your hat at all, no matter what color they were. That was ridiculous. You were the most aggravating child. I don't see why it's any more ridiculous to wear flowers on your hat than on your dress, protested Anne. Lots of little girls there had bouquets pinned to their dresses. What's the difference? Marilla was not to be drawn from the safe concrete into dubious paths of the abstract. Don't answer me back like that, Anne. It was very silly of you to do such a thing. Never let me catch you at such a trick again. Mrs. Rachel said she thought she would sink through the floor when she saw you come in all rigged out like that. She couldn't get near enough to tell you to take them off till it was too late. She says people talked about it something dreadful. Of course they would think I had no better sense than let you go ducked out like that. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Anne, tears welling into her eyes. I never thought you'd mind. The roses and the buttercups were so sweet and pretty. I thought they'd look lovely on my hat. Lots of the little girls had artificial flowers on their hats. I'm afraid I'm going to be a dreadful trial to you. Maybe you'd be better to send me back to the asylum. That would be terrible. I don't think I can endure it. Most likely I would go into consumption. I'm so thin as it is, you see, but that would be better than being a trial to you. Nonsense, said Marilla, vexed at herself for having made the child cry. I don't want to send you back to the asylum, I'm sure. All I want is that you should behave like every other little girl and not make yourself ridiculous. Don't cry anymore. I've got some news for you. Diana Barry came home this afternoon. I'm going up to see if I can borrow a skirt pattern from Mrs. Barry. And if you like, you can come with me and get acquainted with Dinah. Anne rose to her feet with clasped hands, the tears still glistening on her cheeks. The dish towel she had been hemming slipped unheeded to the floor. Oh, Marilla, I'm so frightened. Now that it has come, now that it has come I'm actually frightened. What if she doesn't, shouldn't like me? It would be the most tragical disappointment of my life. Now don't get into a fluster. And I do wish you wouldn't use such long words. It sounds so funny in a little girl. I guess Dinah will, make, will like you well enough. It's her mother you've got to reckon with. If she doesn't like you, it won't matter how much Dinah does. If she has heard about your outburst to Mrs. Lynde and going to church with buttercups around your hat, I don't know what she'll think of you. You must be polite and well-behaved and don't make any of your startling speeches. For pity's sakes, if the child isn't actually trembling. Anne was trembling. Her face was pale and tense. Oh, Marilla, you'd be excited too if you were going to meet a girl you hoped to be your bosom friend and whose mother mightn't like you, she said as she hastened to get her hat. They went to... They went over to Orchard Slope by the shortcut across the brook and up the furry hill grove. Mrs. Barry came to the kitchen door in answer to Marilla's knock. She was a tall, black-eyed, black-haired woman with a very resolute mouth. She had the reputation of being very strict with her children. How do you do, Marilla? She said cordially. cordially. Come in. And this is the little girl you have adopted, I suppose? Yes, this is Anne Shirley said Marilla. Spelled with an E, gasped Anne, whose tremulous and excited as she was, was determined there would be no misunderstanding on that important point. Mrs. Barry, not hearing or comprehending, merely shook hands and said kindly, How are you? I'm well in body, although considered rumpled up in spirit. Thank you, ma'am, said Anne gravely. Then aside to Marilla in an audible whisper, there wasn't anything startling in that, was there, Marilla? Dinah was sitting on the sofa reading a book, which she dropped when the callers entered. She was a very pretty little girl, with her mother's black eyes and hair and rosy cheeks and the merry expression which was her inheritance from her father. This is my little girl, Dinah, said Mrs. Barry. Dinah, you might take Anne out into the garner, garden and show her your flowers. It would be better for you than straining your eyes over that book. She reads entirely too much, this to Marilla as the little girls went out. And I can't prevent her, for her father aids and abets her. She's always poring over a book. I'm glad she has the prospect of a playmate. Perhaps it will take her more out of doors. Outside in the garden, 
which was a full, mellow sunset, sunset light streaming through the dark old firs to the west of it, stood Anne and Dinah gazing ba- bashfully at each other over a clump of gorgeous tiger lilies. The berry garden was a bowery of wild wilderness of flowers which would have delighted Anne's heart at any time less fraught with destiny. It was encircled by huge old willows and tall firs beneath which fl- flourished flowers that loved the shade. Prim right angled paths neatly bordered the clamshells, intersected it like moist red ribbons and the beds between old fashioned flowers ran riot. There were rosy bleeding hearts and great splendid crimson peonies and white fragrant narcissi and thorny sweet scotch roses, blue and pink and blue and white columbines and lilac tainted bouncing bets, clumps of southern wood and ribbon grass and mint, purple Adam and Eve daffodils and a mass of sweet clover while its delicate fragrant feathery sprays sparkling lightning that shot its fiery lances over the prim white musk flowers, a garden it was where sunshine lingered and bees hummed and winds beguiled into loitering and purred and rustled. Oh, Dinah, said Anne at last, clasping her hands and speaking almost in a whisper. Oh, do you think you can like me a little, enough to be my bosom friend? Dinah laughed. Dinah always laughed before she spoke. Well, I guess so, she said frankly. I'm awfully glad you came to live at Green Gables. It would be jolly to have somebody to play with. There isn't any other girl who lives near enough to play with, and I've no sisters big enough. Will you swear to be my friend forever and ever? demanded Anne eagerly. Dinah looked shocked. Why is so dreadfully wicked to swear, she said rebukingly. Oh no, not my kind of swearing. There are two kinds, you know. I've never heard of... But one, said Dinah doubtfully. There is, there really is another. Oh, it isn't wicked at all. It just means vowing and promising solemnly. Well, I don't mind doing that, agreed Diana, re- relieved. How do you do it? We must join hands. So, said Anne gravely. It ought to be over running water. Well, just imagine this path is running water. I repeat the oath first. I solemnly swear to be faithful to my bosom friend, Dinah Barry, as long as the sun and the moon shall endure. Now you say it and put my name in it. Dinah repeated the oath with a laugh for an act. Then she said, You are a queer girl, Anne. I heard before that you were queer, but I believe I'm going to like you real well. When Marilla and Anne went home, Dinah went with them as far as the Long Bridge. The two little girls walked with their arms about each other. At the brook, they parted with many, many promises to spend the next afternoon together. Well, did you find Dinah a kindred spirit? Asked Marilla as they went up through the Garden of Green Gables. Oh, yes, sighed Anne blissfully, unconscious of any sarcasm on Marilla's part. Oh, Marilla, I'm the happiest girl on Prince Edward Island this very moment. I assure you, I'll say my prayers with a right good will tonight. Dinah and I are going to build a playhouse in Mr. William Bell's birch grove tomorrow. Can I have those broken pieces of china that are out in the woodshed? Dinah's birthday is in February, and mine is in March. Don't you think that's a very strange coincidence? Dinah is going to lend me a book to read. She says it's perfectly splendid and tremendously exciting. She's going to show me a place back in the woods where rice lilies grow. Don't you think Dinah has got very soulful eyes? I wish I had soulful eyes.